Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Blake Bauckham and I'm the Director of Sales for Osteogenix. Before we get started, let me address how we will be interacting today. From a technical perspective, we can't hear or see you, but we would love to hear from you and be able to answer any questions that you may have. There's a question and answer button on the right hand side of your screen where you can type your questions at any time and we will try to get them answered during the webinar. Let me introduce the man that needs no introduction, Dr. Sasha Ivanovich. He was formally trained in periodontics at UCLA School of Dentistry, in implant dentistry at Loma Linda University, and in prosthodontics at the University of Aiken in Germany. He also holds a Master of Science degree in Oral Biology from UCLA. Dr. Ivanovich's clinical research emphasizes aesthetic management in dental implant therapy and applied bone and soft tissue reconstruction techniques. He presents and teaches his implant protocols globally and is academic chair of the Guide Institute, assistant professor at Loma Linda University, past president of the European Association of Osseointegration, past co-director of the UCLA Implant uh, Dental Implant Center, honorary member and award recipient of several academic organizations and editorial boards for scientific journals. His multidisciplinary dental practice is based in Santa Monica, California, and he restricts his clinical work to dental implant therapy, bone and soft tissue, tissue reconstruction, and aesthetic dentistry. Dr. Yovanovich, thank you so much for your time and being here today. We've worked, uh, you and I have worked together for, oh, it's been 10 years or so in house. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing the presentation today. Thank you, Blake. It's a pleasure for me uh, to come to all of you here um, with this presentation. Uh, we're here in Los Angeles at this moment. It's uh, about 4 p.m. LA time. And uh, we had a normal day here in the practice with patients. We had academic work. So uh, this is a great time to finish the day. And um, Blake, the, the request that you had and osteogenics had, and of course the invitation is very kindly received by me because I think that talking about like a very simple topic is so important sometimes. So like the topic of sutures really can... Uh, help us in every day. I just see like, you know, so many times incision openings. I see inflammation in tissues because of the type of sutures which are being used. I see needles which are too large, so you cannot really anchor them to the correct periosteum. I see sutures, you know, utilized in areas where they're like, you know, tearing through the tissues and again, like inflammation happens. So I think it's a very good topic. So let's start with the topic and I'm just going to give you a moment to look at where my home is, so to say. This is the Guide Institute and the Guide Dental Center. And we're based in uh, Los Angeles with um, kind of normally very, very lucky weather, but this winter has been uh, absolutely a very challenging winter for Southern California. Um, in some respects, good because the water is shortage, but in some respects, very poor. But um, I think spring is coming, so hopefully we're gonna get out of this. Um, here I can just give you uh, two of our like, you know, top programs which we offer to dentists uh, in North America but also around the world. Basically, it's one is our top end program which is a uh, modular one-year comprehensive implant program where really dentists go through training in a way that is very comprehensive and it goes really very evidence-based but still very practical and they learn really what are the top steps in implants. And secondly, we have a very um, user-friendly uh, video library, which has been going on now for many years, and it gets uploads of new controlled videos every week, which is the uh, guide video library. So please have a look at that, and uh, between any of those two, you'll be able to really satisfy your needs of either like you know, clinical or academic or combination of both. Now to the topic. So what does suturing mean really in, in general terms? So we have to remember that uh, really when we're trying to suture uh, in any type of work that we're doing, could be like you know, periodontics, could be like implant dentistry, could be oral surgery, could be even endodontic uh, surgery. It's really the goal is first of all to have an idea and a concept to place the flap and the tissues in exactly the position that we need it for optimal healing. And of course, we need to do this without any kind of tension. So it's really, really important to do this. 
many times clinicians make a mistake and this is like sometimes like you know you have to think about that it's like suturing of course is utilizing a material which is not optimal for tissues right because we're going through the tissues with a needle which is already trauma and we're also putting a material into the tissues which possibly is not really optimal in 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 kind of biocompatibility so and then you're putting tension on it so let's say suturing less suturing is more healthy healing so this particular slide was just more like of a fun slide because you know many people like sometimes over suture a site so maintain always the health of the flap and maintain maximum vascularity so like you know utilize the proper needle a small needle utilize the proper suture material so minimal inflammation and of course use a technique which is minimal tension so like really always think about vascularity in your flap now some parts of suturing technique which are really really useful is the following and that is that you know we have an idea that you have to remember to really do for sutures now this is kind of, I can't see this. you have to like always <laughs> I can't see this <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. I can see. Um, you have to always make sure that when you have a flap and before you're suturing, the flap content has to be really, again, maximum vascularity. So there should be no, you know, bone particles there. There should be no soft tissue particles there. Before you suture anything, it needs to be clean. So I use, for example, in flap uh, management, always the maximum amount of irrigation that I can do and that we can control to get rid of any kind of side materials. Then place the flap again in a position that's desired. So what, what do you wanna do? Do you wanna move the flap in a coronal direction or do you wanna move a flap in an apical direction? So two different motions that we're trying to do. But we don't wanna have any tension. So we always are very, very like careful about releasing a flap so that when we're suturing it, we're not putting tension on it. So flap management is crucial about suturing so it's like you know you really have to think about that then when you're like looking at adding a suture technique so like just strictly thinking about the needle you always want to go with that needle at a direct angle through the flap so that's like it's like you almost have to think about like a needle being a straight a needle which just goes straight through because the more you go at an angle of course the more the bevel will limit the thickness of the tissue and the more of course technically and biologically speaking it's going to be a problem and it could tear through so really think about really always direct angles another problem which often happens with suturing is that you know people take a bite of the flap which actually is really too small and too short to the incision so now the problem is that you're going into that bite and when you're putting a little bit of like closure or a knot on it you can pull through it. So I have kind of this minimum distance, which I like to keep, which is three millimeters, three to four millimeters away from the incision margin. So that's really helpful. Then another top priority key point is do never place a knot on top of an incision. Because again, like with the thickness of the knot and possibly some bacterial content, that can move into the incision and then can give you an inflammation. So suturing has just some, some of these basic, simple principles. And again, closure with no tension then let's go to um, the types of sutures I think it's okay yeah um, if you could just keep it here let's go yeah and move it a little bit down no, no just just the top yeah okay perfect yeah okay now let's talk about the type of sutures I'm gonna go a little bit more technical and want to see like if I can help you to go through the jungle which is out there so I've done a couple of posts on social media on Guide Dental, and I think it was also shared on, um, with osteogenics about suture materials. And, and so this is kind of like an, kind of a repeat of that. So if you want to see more of this, you can go on the social media sites of uh, Guide Dental and of osteogenics. So basically, we have two types of sutures which are important in practice. One is, of course, the non-resorbable type. Other one is the resorbable type. Now, when you're thinking about non-resorbable, when do I use that? So predominantly, we use non-resorbable sutures for implant placement and for any kind of GBR or bone grafting or sinus grafting. So any type of heart tissue grafting and any type of implant placement, 
it's mostly a non-resorbable suture. So then we go straight to the resorbable suture. Like when, when is that indication? So usually, and that's more in most of the cases, like when I say most, I would say 80 to 90%, it's for mucogingival surgery. So anytime you're going to do any kind of periodontal, flap procedure, any type you're doing any kind of soft tissue procedures around implants, a mucogingival procedure, let's say uncovering or any kind of grafting of soft tissue, it's resorbable. Okay, so that's already distinctively different. Now let's go back to non-resorbable. So you're doing an implant placement, you might do also a GBR procedure, and you're now going to close the flap. The two top sutures that you want to use here, and I'm going to exclude everything that you don't see here because I, I personally don't use them. So the top suture that I'll use for implant placement on, and for GBR is a PTFE suture. And of course, that has the trademark of cytoplast, which of course, why we're doing the webinar today is with osteogenics. Then the second one is you can use nylon. And we'll go a little bit more into nylon because there's different type of nylons out there. You have the generic type of nylons and you have the more trademark nylons, which are more premium. So again, one trademark that I like to use is the Resorba one. And that one is like a very good you know, company who makes really premium nylon sutures. And we'll go a little bit more into that. So these are just like generically speaking. Now let's, let's just stick to this here, PTFE or nylon. And usually I use PTFE for like flap closures, which have more thickness and have more like, you know, coverage. So you need to cover like a lot of implants or you have done implants with a bone graft and you need to really have a suture there, which is going to hold that flap together. Cause there's a lot at stake here because you have a big bone graft underneath, you have multiple implants underneath and you know, you need to keep that incision really close. So PTFE is probably the best suture that you can do for your patient. Nylon is the advantage is it's a little bit smaller, a little bit thinner, has smaller needles. So they're usually good for like thinner tissues when you have maybe like a papilla you have to close or some soft tissue. So that really works well. Now let's go to uh, resorbable sutures. So you're looking at like mucogingival surgery. The most known suture is probably vicro or gut. I'm not going to mention gut because basically that's like a material that is not being used or recommended for like, you know, really... Um, detailed surgery because there's so much inflammation with that so we don't use that so I per personally don't have it in the practice now Vicro is a good suture it's more stable uh, but you have also these other sutures which are polyglyconate and they're like a little bit less inflammatory and again they have been made in such a way that can be monofilament so my preferred suture for resorbable is not a polyglycolic acid one which is more braided mine is like a polyglyconate which can, can be made in a monofilament, which again is much better from a plaque you know, type of accumulation. Now let's talk for a moment about like the management of the suture. You, you need, of course, a good needle holder. So the one that I use is a Castro Viejo. I have with Euphridi and Dr. Jovanovic instrument kit, so you can just look that up. And there's like, you know, several instruments there, but I, I want to focus mainly here on the needle holder for the suture because it's really difficult to do high quality suturing technique if you don't have a good needle holder. So uh, there are several of these. You have like, you know, thicker castrovejos, you have thinner castrovejos, depending on the needle size that you're using. You know, in most surgical kits, you probably have a good need for like, you know, a medium one where you can do like a 4-0 or a 5 or suture really works well. But it's really important that you have these type of um, needle holders. Now let's talk about suture sizes because there's a lot of confusion, right? Like even in my office, which is very specialized in surgery, you know, sometimes there's boxes missing or needles are missing. And then I have to get on the phone very quickly with osteogenics or with Blake and say, Hey, I have an emergency. I need like some special sutures. And uh, um, Blake, I'm sure is smiling at this moment because he will kind of know when this happens. So let's, let's try to prevent this. So basically, we're recommending anything between 3.0 and 6.0. Any of those sutures are really good. And so that's kind of your main target. That's the range. Now, you're probably going to use most often somewhere in that 4.0 to 5.0. Now, I have a particular indication for 3.0, and that is like the incision closure after GBR, where I use a 3.0 or 3.0 cytoplast suture, because that's really an amazing suture, like an excellent suture 
from a standpoint of like, you know, flap management, closure. Uh, 6.0, just to go to the other extreme, is really an, a beautiful suture because it's a smaller needle for like when you have thin tissues or when you're closing a papilla. So just remember always, smaller suture sizes are great because they're really thin and easy to manage through the tissues, but they have no or minimal tensile strength. So if you are like, you know, very kind of manipulating the tissues a lot and you're pulling too hard on the knot, it will break. So you really have to work very fine with this and you have to have a high dexterity to, to do this. But like, you know, when you do mucogingival surgery, usually it will go to the 5.0, 6.0, sometimes even 7.0. So the larger sizes really cause a little bit more trauma. So you have to do it in flaps, which are thicker. So that's why I say 3.0 and 4.0 are more like for thicker flaps. Now let's talk about needle sizes. Also really, really important because that many uh, clinicians don't really pay too much attention or don't really look at that too much. But you have to remember that the needle size, so the, 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 the curve has a certain length. So the smaller sizes, let's say a 10 millimeter, have shorter bites. So when you, for example, have very thin tissue, and you have maybe some periosteal tissue, it's really nice to go with a small needle through that area because that kind of gives you like a quick turn and also there's very little trauma to the tissue because it's so thin. But obviously a 10 millimeter thin needle is not gonna be very helpful when you have a thick flap. So that's why we then use like the longer needles like a 13 or even 16 millimeter needle. Um, and of course these numbers vary a little bit, but you basically have to always keep in your mind you have Short needles, which are really for mucogingival surgery, maybe for periosteal suturing, and I'll give you some examples. And then have the long needles if you're having a full thickness flap. And the larger size, of course, have a long bite, so you can go through thick, thick tissue and you can do full thickness flap. So that's really helpful. Now here, a look at a PTFE. So this is like a suture which is really important to me, and I use this on a daily basis. It's number one, I would say it's monofilament. Number two, it's inert. So there's really minimal tissue inflammation. And it's also like a little bit elastic. It, it gives you the potential to tie the second knot, sometimes even the third knot. So it's a very, very user-friendly suture. Then it's also a very patient-friendly suture because it's very, very soft. So I can have sometimes sutures on the palate or in the, in the crestal area that like you have like minimal trauma to the patient. And it can stay there for two weeks or three weeks. So therefore, in my office, I remove sutures after 14 days. So it keeps it really, really comfortable for patients. And yeah, they sometimes will say, oh, can I remove the sutures? Feels better. But it's not nothing like, you know, you see with these, you know, big sutures that you see. So cytoplasm is my go-to and definitely something that will change your life if you haven't used them before. Okay, nylon is also a great suture from a non-resorbable perspective because it's also inert, it's monofilament, and has very minimal to no tissue inflammation, so that's great. But there are some consequences with this one and some drawbacks because it's kind of a little bit more rigid, it's not as soft as a PTFE, and especially when you're going to the bigger sizes to hold a bigger full thickness flap, they can really be like irritating the tissues. So usually, you know, these sutures are not as soft as PTFE. So we don't use them in a larger size. Let's say a 3.0 or 4.0 nylon is not my preference. And they also have sometimes, depending on what kind of suture you're using, you can use nylon like a generic type. They have this wicking that it goes through like, you know, like a wave, and it's really hard to manage. So it's not something nice to work with. Now the good news is when you use the premium nylon like Resolon from uh, Resorba, they actually are really produced that it comes almost like in a straight suture, which is like almost like a straight hair. So it's really easy to work with. So, um, and they're also a little bit softer. So it really helps you if you like to use nylon. And I like to use nylon, for example, for vertical incisions, to use a material which is more premium and, and it doesn't have that much memory and is still soft for the patient. So here's just kind of a summary of this here. So you got the non-resorbable sutures for implant GBR, your PTFE cytoplast. You can use general nylon, so it's a polypropylene, but not probably recommended by me. And then you have the premium nylon, which I would re recommend, which is the Resolon or the, from the Resorba company. Then Resorbo sutures are good for implant mucogingival work. So again, you can use something like, you know, Vicro, very generic, polyglycolic, 
but it's like a polyfilament, so there's a lot of wicking. So again, I, w I don't use it in my practice. So as an opportunity, as an advancement, and as an improvement, you can use like a polyglyconate or a resorba, which is more monofilament, so it's more inert. So this is kind of my go-to when I look at sutures to work with. Now, again, this is just going the, the visual of the boxes. I mean, it's a very traditional type of like, you know, uh, suture material comes just in a package, sterile, and you can use this. And, and I just here for com completeness, I'm also adding here, like, you know, for example, a Euphredi suture. But, you know, these sutures are also good, but they're more, more generic. So they don't have that premium quality that, for example, the needle is really, like, you know, attached in a very unique way uh, to the suture, the suture to the needle, and that the, both the needle and the suture are premium made. So, but, of course, it, it, it's always good to have these opportunities and these options in your practice. Now here's a little bit of the suture sizes. So look at this, what, what we're recommending. So usually for nylon, I would recommend like a 4.0, 5.0, 6.0. So probably more to the smaller size, even a 7.0. For the PTFE, I would go more to a 3.0, 4.0, maximum 5.0. Although you can go smaller, but it's kind of, I, like, I like this differentiation. So just remember, the more you go to a smaller size, so 5.0, 6.0, 7.0, the tensile strength is going to be weaker. So you have more potential when you're tying the knot or when you're pulling on it that it will fracture. Then needles. Um, there are some round ones, so half size. Um, it makes a really quick turn, but it's not something really like that we use in, in um, oral surgery or periodontal surgery or implant surgery. We usually use the 3 8 So pretty much every suture that I have in my practice is a 3 8 then I mentioned this already. You can go with small, uh, small needle size to, to large. So you got to have a variation. I mean, obviously a 13, somewhere in the middle of the range is going to work for many, many indications. But, you know, I run into these situations all the time. I want to pick up some periosteum or have a really thin papilla. I want to have a small needle. So it's good to have this as a backup. So I would always like recommend to clinicians, you know, have, of course, enough suture material available in your practice for the middle range, so the 50% that you're doing, but you got to have something larger for those 25% on the outer range and something smaller for the lower 25%. So that's the, the 10 or the 16. This is a suture I talked about. You can have round needles, um, but usually round needles are not really that effective when you're thinking about um, keratinized gingiva. So basically everything we use is reverse cutting. So uh, reverse cutting is really the norm. And that's what we have. It prevents the tearing of the flap. And again, as I mentioned, you have these different sizes which can be attached to this. So then from a knot standpoint, many questions always come up like, hey, is two knots enough or should I do three? And I do four. Uh, I started doing four knots really traditionally, um, really with PTFE sutures because they have this beauty that like, you know, at the first knot, when you're tying it, obviously it can loosen a little bit but you can still tighten it with a second knot, which is basically that looseness. You can even tighten it with a third knot. So I keep that fourth knot in there just for security and it kind of, I don't have really knot loosenings. I prefer a surgeon's knot, different ways, but four knots is important. And I think that like in the community, the two knot type of history really comes just from the old days when silk sutures were being used, which we don't use today anymore. And just that, like, you know, it was just like you lock them, they're locked, but they're very difficult to manage. Uh, nylon, I do the same thing, four knots. It's really like four turns, really recommended to have really no loosening. And then there's one more thing that I would like to um, just mention here from a type of like um, suture uh, cutting. Um, make sure that your, your team or like whoever can... Um, clips the, the or uh, cuts the suture, doesn't cut it too close to the knot because obviously it can loosen. So I always like, you know, like the, um, the suture to be cut approximately three to five millimeters above the knot. That really helps me to maintain stability. So let's go into like a couple of suturing techniques now. Now, most important for me, when I close a flap just after a normal implant placement with or without 
GBR bone augmentation is to understand that I need two closures, suture incisions, uh, su sorry, suture techniques. One is a horizontal mattress, and in between each horizontal mattress, a single interrupted. This will evert my flap, and it will bring the flap margins nicely together. Second closure is, of course, my vertical incisions. On the vertical incisions, I don't really need a single interrupt. Sorry, I don't need a horizontal mattress. I just need a single interrupter. Here you can see the horizontal mattress, just for those of you who um, would like to have a review here. So basically, you always keep the tension away from the flap edges because you want to get this flap to be everting. So you want, to, you want it to come up. So this is all your corona repositioning. And you always use this in conjunction with an interrupted suture. So you can see here just like an, a typical cytoplast uh, closure with a horizontal mattress. And this just makes it really nice. Important, of course, is that all the dimensions are similar. So you're looking at entering the buckle, let's say three millimeters from the margin, exit to the lingual or palatal, three millimeters. If you're giving a horizontal, go about three millimeters and then back in and come through the buckle. So it's really important for us to maintain that width that is optimal. So that's really, really important and in, keep those distances in a similar, unique way. Now, single interrupted, they go in between the mattresses or they can also sometimes be for in one stage implant placement. We use a lot of tissue level implants. So like, you know, in tissue level implants, it's great to have a suture mesial and distal and just could be a single interrupted. But again, just take a deep bite. It's really important to take a lot of tissue, so you have less trauma to the margin, you have less chance of that suture loosening, loosening itself. Then here's like a good visual on the left side of a flap margin, which has been everted coronally. So you're moving this flap margin up. You can see a three cytoplast horizontal mattress sutures. I always start off in the middle with the horizontal mattress. Once I've moved the flap in a nice way, in a, in a perfect way together, I'll go to the left and to the right side. And then on the right side, you can see the single interrupted sutures. So they're going right in between. And again, you see no knots on the incision. They're all like, you know, either buckle or lingual. Here, a similar visual. You can see here the incision and the flap. Then you see the horizontal mattress. These are all like bringing the flap in a coronal direction. And then between each of them, you can see a single interrupted. So that's really important that you can see how the single interrupted has that visual. Here, just like a combination of different sutures. Notice here how the horizontal mattress, again, is really optimal, bringing the flap and closing that. So that's really good. It's all done with, uh, with monofilament, uh, PTFE. And then you have the vertical incisions. Then I'm going now to a special suturing technique for the connective tissue graft. So this is one which, if I have time, I'll show it to you. When I go to the palate to harvest some tissue, and I take a connective tissue graft from the palate. Again, I like to use PTFE cytoplast. But you know, often when you take a subepithelial connective tissue graft from here, you have a lot of bleeding. And so, of course, clinicians are concerned about this. Patients really get really nervous about this. And it's one of the worst things that can happen, really, when, of course, patients leave your office, that they're really anxious and concerned about this. So I have this suture technique, which kind of almost gives you an... Um, a perfect uh, control of any bleeding. And here you just see one case. So you can see the palatal, you see on the palatal how I took the tissue away, and this is one week later. So it was one horizontal incision where I took the connective tissue from internal, and then I placed it in this particular uh, patient on a single implant in the anterior, and I closed it again with a horizontal mattress and with like single interrupted. But now look at in the left photograph where you see how I closed with like some compression sutures. These are, again, mattress sutures, which are external, and they're compressing the flap. And you can see that here, where you can see a better visual of this here when you're looking. And look at the healing. And here is the visual. So this is a very unique anchor suture. And I'll just show you, first of all, you, um, locate the incision. You see the horizontal incision there? And you see already my PTFE sutures. We have and there's several videos of this connective tissue harvest, by the way, in our guide video library. So you can review this here also on your own time. But 
I'm calling this like an external anchor mattress suture, or you could call it an external anchor compression suture. Because what it does, it compresses the flap to the underlying periosteum. And I'll give you some numbers. So the entry of the needle goes here. Do you see the number one on your screen? That would be your entry of the needle. And you're taking like a nice big bite there in healthy tissue. Then you're exiting, that's your mattress, right there at number two. Number two is like, you know, just you took a bite. Number three will be when you're going at the top with your needle and you're going underneath the marginal gingiva. So you're at bone level with your needle, but you're exiting at number four at tissue level. And then you tie it off with four knots. And basically, when you're looking at that uh, suture that is between number two and number three, that's going to compress the flap inwards. And that will stop the bleeding if you have any kind of blood vessels which have been opened. And the suture that's between number one and number four is going to compress the gingival margin. So that's also going to help you to stop the bleeding from the coronal part. I usually start with these sutures in the posterior. So like, let's say my uh, molar site, and then I go forward and I do probably three sutures like this and the bleeding stops. Most of these patients have no palatal plates because they don't need it. So this is a very, very important suture to kind of remember. And we train this suture in our soft tissue course, hands-on course, to our dentist. And if I have time, I'll show it to you here in the presentation. Another important suture for me to uh, remind you of. So just kind of going back for one moment, I like to use, um, I like to use, I can't go back, huh? No. Okay. You can go back? Oh, this one. Okay. Okay. Um, so just to summar, make a summary again, for the palatal connective tissue harvest site, I like to use PTFE. Why? Because I can put enough tensile strength on it so I can compress that flap, so I stop the bleeding. Of course, I can use a resorbable suture here. Of course, I can use a nylon suture here. Not a problem, but I can't put enough tension on it because it will break. And this suture also on the palate has the big advantage to patients. It's so soft. So there is no really not so much trauma for the tongue. So I like this sutures. There's other options. You can do other sutures. That's fine. But that's why I like it. Now let's go to a uh, type of case that we do very often. It's your full large case where you're doing an uh, immediate delivery of a hybrid prosthesis. I don't know if you've seen some of the work that we've been doing. It's been on social media at Guide Dental where we're basically you know, treating these full arch cases like an all on four in failing dentitions or indenture cases with, with implants immediately. And then we're printing in-house a full hybrid prosthesis. So, but you gotta close the flap. So my strong recommendation here is, you know, make sure, maintain all the keratinous gingiva. So maybe do some nice, simple, small horizontal mattress sutures so you can maintain all the keratinous gingiva. Don't just use single interrupter because you're going to roll the keratin and gingiva in, you're going to lose it. And then it's very important to use resorbable sutures because it's really tough with the swelling that the patient has to remove non-resorbable sutures underneath a hybrid prosthesis. And many of these hybrid prostheses don't have the space. And you don't want to remove the hybrid prosthesis, you know, shortly after implant placement. So here, my go-to is, for example, a 4-0 glycolon suture. Perfect for this indication. 4 or glycolon. Perfect. Um, now I'm going to show you like a mucogingival procedure. This is like a case where like, you know, you have a posterior mandibular case and obviously there's no vestibulum, there's no keratinized gingiva. So I need to establish here vestibular depth and I need to establish here keratinized gingival margins around these three implants. So I do my mucogingival procedure, which is basically a split thickness flap. I'm apically repositioning the flap. And now I need to suture it. Now, now we go to very, very unique suture demands. I need a small needle. So I probably will use a 10 millimeter needle here. So I can go to the margin of that flap, which is mucosal, so it's thin. And I can grab some periosteum, which is also thin. And I'm going to reposition that, suture, that, that, that flap margin in the apical direction. So this will probably be a um, glycolon. 5 or 6 with a 10 millimeter needle, something like this, in that range. Absolutely not using a PTFE here. 
and absolutely not using a nylon here, right? So this is only territory for resorbable sutures, and my preferred one here is the glycolon. Then we move to the next step is uh, placing the ginger graft that I harvested from the palate. So this is a strip ginger graft as it was uh, published and documented by uh, Dr. Henry Takei from UCLA many years ago. But it's like a beautiful graft, very minimal trauma to the patient and big effect on increasing creatinine gingiva. So here you can see how I'm using that. And again here, my go-to suture because it's mucogingival surgery is a resorbable suture. So again here I'm using a glycolon. I want something maybe a little bit bigger so I could go with a 10 but I could go with a 13 millimeter needle, that's fine. And I can probably go with a 5-0 or a 6-0 because I just need to place these sutures to hold this keratinized gingiva in gra a graft in place. So this is a purely a resorbable case with a smaller needle and a smaller suture size. And then you can see the healing. Look first on the left side, that's about 14 days after. Usually I see patients 14 days later. And you can see the sutures are usually gone between 14 to 21 days. And then you can see the strip graft, how it's healing on the palate. Beautiful. So I'm always like very excited to offer this to our patients. We give them a palatal plate just to be sure, but the healing is really so excellent. And then I want to switch now to camera. Blake, so if you allow me, I'll move yep. more into full screen. We've got a few more Perfect. minutes. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll switch over now to a hands-on portion where Sasha's going to show the, the different knots, the different materials, the instrumentation. Uh, but we really want this to be an interactive session. So as questions come up, please put those in the chat using that question and answer button that we described earlier. Uh, and, and while Sasha is actually working, we're going to interactively handle those questions. So please don't be shy. Any question is a good question. We just want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to make this a, a fun and interactive session for everyone. Okay. So first of all, let me, what is, what is showing right now? Which camera is showing? Just me? It's you and the, uh, the doc camera, so both. Oh, both of them. Okay, good. Okay, so I just want to show you maybe like something on the doc camera. So you can see like, this is good for me to, to demonstrate to you. So like here, this is, for example, a suture that I use a lot from a standpoint of like implant placement and GBR. So this is for my suture 30 cytoplast, and you can see the needle, which is a 16 millimeter needle. Okay, so this is my go-to. I mean, this is probably, and I think that um, it kind of is sometimes sold out because probably many people are using it, but that's my go-to. Then you do have, of course, the opportunity to switch it around a little bit. And you can see a 4.0 and a 5.0, and definitely very useful as well. And you just kind of have to see when is your indication to, to do this. They both work. Of course, the beauty with the 5.0 is that it gets thinner. And you can also see the needle is a 13 millimeter. I love this suture. So like I will never complain to use a cytoplast or like a PTFE suture. So it's my go-to is for flaps is usually like a 3.0, but I can go to 4.0 and 5.0 at any time uh, from a standpoint of management. Now let's go to the Resilon. So these are like, you know, the, the nylon sutures. And I'm just putting a couple out here so you can see it. Because probably like the most used one again from nylon is probably the 5.0 Resilon. And the suture sizes are different. You can see a 13 millimeter, but of course, depending on what you have and what's available, you could probably go to something smaller. Notice that when you're going to a smaller suture size, this is a 16 millimeter, that you have actually here also like you know, the opportunity to have larger needles. This is a 13 millimeter needle, but of course you can also go smaller. So sometimes you have to be aware of these products, how they are and what you need them for. So like, it's, it's tough for the clinician because you say to your, um, to your nurse or to your team, give me a 6-0 suture, but just be aware that there's different needle sizes. So you want to make sure that like, you know, you have the opportunity to just have one particular suture that you like in a particular needle size, or, you know, you have to be specifying this here. And then just showing you here, this here is like a really unique suture because it's a 7-0 suture. And these of course are very useful. Like when you have very thin tissue, you're doing mucogingival surgery, maybe you're doing a tunneling procedure, you have a small soft tissue graft. So these are kind of really unique. And uh, these are all nylon. Now, then my other, this is probably the one that I really um, utilize a lot for like mucogingival surgery. That's the glycolon one. 
And this one is, of course, the suture that has, like, you know, the opportunity to show you the monofilament, polyglycronate. It resorbs in about 14 days to 21 days. And this would be a great one for mucogingival work, that just the work I just showed you, or like in a full arch case underneath a hybrid prosthesis. And of course, you can go also smaller in size. So you can see a 6 -0. But again, remember, the thinner you go, the more you have you know, problems with this here uh, possibly uh, breaking through. Now I want to show you, I guess, like two sutures, basically. Uh, and, and let's go to a model. And maybe I can... Um, any questions, Blake? Because I, I can't really see the chat, so you have to help me. Sure, I'll. I'll I don't know if you can. I'll ask you the questions as they come up. One one question that we do get occasionally, Doctor Ivanovich, is with with the glycolon suture in particular. We hear from some customers that they want a suture that resorbs a little bit more quickly than glycolon. Um, so maybe you could just speak about that resorption profile, and if you think. That's that's something that should be focused on, or or you like the resorption profile. What's what is your your answer to that question? If people ask you about the resorption profile of of glycolon, there. Um, okay, yeah, I think it's a good question. So first of all, let me just answer it in this way. Um, for me, like a suture should stay in place for at least two weeks. So two weeks is for me like a really minimum because when you look at all the research we have with collagen fibers healing, it's like you know below fourteen days the tensile strength of collagen fibers is still very low. So you want to leave sutures in for a certain amount of time. So I like that when sutures are stable for about 14 days. So I don't need it shorter. Um, if you want it shorter, then yeah, just cut it. You know, it's not a problem because like the beauty of resorbable sutures is like, you know, if you cut the knot and you leave the suture in place, it will just resorb by itself. So yeah, I don't, I don't see this as a problem. Perfect. So okay. you, really you're trying to get to the critical two week time frame, And if it's, if it's shorter than that, you, you run some risk. Yeah, and, and you know what, and I, I really don't think it's um, uh, patients are having any issues with this here, but like, you know, if you want to go shorter, um, yeah, I would just like ask the patient to come back or, you know, maybe you have a, a different product that you, you can find. But like the one thing that I would discourage you from, uh, and I, I think I'm allowed to do that, is just don't use gut because you can use gut in like cases, maybe like a third molar where you're just doing a quick uh, procedure um, but like when you're doing fine procedures, which are mucogingival, grafting procedures, implant procedures, I, I don't think that gut has any place in it. Okay, yeah, great. So great what we're going to do right. here um, is we're going to take a model, right? So I have the model here. Can you see the model, uh, Blake? Yes, we can see it. Can you see that? Okay, perfect. So what I want to show you, and this is like one of the workshops that we do here at Guide and around the world. Uh, when we uh, teach clinicians how to do a connective tissue grab. But I, I did already the pre-work here. So I just took some soft tissue. I'm cutting it out of here. because And here's my connective tissue graft, right? So that's my autogenous connective tissue graft. I'm not going to do anything with it, but I just wanted to do this here. Now, see my horizontal incision here? And as you can see, a lot of blood can come out of here because I removed the graft from here. So what I will use now for this one is probably like an 4-0, 4 PTFE, but I could probably also do a 5 -0, but I'm going to just do like for now a 4 -0, so it's also like a little bit thicker, so it's visible, and I'm going to go grab it. So when I grab it, I don't grab the needle at the end of it. I always like leave a couple of millimeters free. You can see that? All right, so that's good. And now I'm going to show you my suture technique. So here's like my suture technique is going to come in and go apical to where I remove the suture, uh, the, the, the connective tissue, and I come out and I'm a little bit restricted here by the camera, but you get the, you can see the in and out, right? And then hey, Sasha, oh, I sorry, real quick. The, uh, the, the question and answer uh, button got closed down, so I think there was some technical difficulty there. But if you have a question or if you've already submitted a question, please resubmit that so we can get to it. Sorry, go. good to go now. Okay, Blake, no problem. Another thing I want to show you, and this can happen in surgery really quickly, is when you're grabbing the needle, don't grab it at the needle point because you're going to destroy the needle point and it's going to be blunt very quickly. So always take it like a little bit below it 
when you're pulling it out. So now I'm pulling it out. So that's my PTFE right there. And now look, I'm just going to show you one suture. What I do now is again, I grab it, right? And then look, very important. I'm going to go press the flap down where I took the connective tissue. I go into this incision and I, get, I go with my needle down to bone level. So I'm going to grab the full thickness of the upper flap and then I come out tissue level. See that? So that's my grab right here. Then again, I'm pulling it out. And now what you will see is that in this particular area here, from here to here, it's going to press the flap margin down. You can see it happening already. So that now compresses the outer flap to the inner periosteum. And when you have a bleeder from the posterior there, of course, that's very, you know, challenging and it's also anxiety, but it can stop it right there. And then I tie the knot, right? So like now I just have to tie it. And as I said, I make a double throw. I tie it, hold it, and I put my knot here at the top. Now you can see what's happening. My second line there is going over the top and to the bottom. So this will close the margin. And then we're going here, grabbing the suture. And now look, it's a little bit loose, right, the suture? But now comes the beauty of the PTFE. I can tighten this. Yeah, look. See that? It's still tight. You can actually see the tension a little bit on the silicone here. At the second one, the second one, usually when you tighten it, will stay tight. Now I do my third one, and I do my fourth one. Perfect, and now I need to scissors. And usually my length that I want to keep this at is about three to five millimeters. Done. So let's show that. I can zoom in. Okay, is it, is it in focus? And you can see how I'm pressing. It's actually like the silicone shows it pretty nicely, like how this flap is pushing down, right? It's pushing down. And this one is moving the margin down. So it stops the bleeding from internal and it stops the bleeding from external. So that's really good. And now, I mean, the only thing, this will probably stop the bleeding already in a patient who's bleeding. But if not, then you just put some pressure with the gauze for like a minute. And then you go to your second suture. And let's go here. I'll just change this a little bit, right? So I'm, oh, sorry. I'm going to go with the second suture. And let's go apically again. Same thing. So I go in. And you can see how the flap is opening. I go out. Okay, is that pretty visible, right? And I grab again the needle. Don't grab the needle point. Okay, hold my my team is assisting me here just so the model doesn't move around and now look i'm going to do the same thing I'm just going to move the model a little bit again i go into this horizontal incision i go all the way down can you see that how much i'm pressing it down yeah you can see that and then i'm coming out so i go from bone level to tissue level of course sometimes you have teeth there so most of the time you'll be in an interproximal spot and if you don't have enough gingival margin, then what you can do, you can run it around a tooth. Now look, now I'm going to close it again, two knots. And same. And actually, it's very nicely visible here in this um, hands-on demo. Three knots and four knots. Okay. And then cut. Cut. Okay. Now I see the two. And I in a patient I would do a third one. Blake, is there any questions on this here? I don't think there's any questions on that. I, I, I think the audience is asking, can we see the horizontal mattress suture and just kind of talk about how you use that to avert the flap if, if you have a model that's showing that? <laughs> um, I can. I have one more, one more thing that I wanted to do for you. 
So yeah, I'll sure. do first one and then I'll do the other one. Um, okay. Just make, give me a cut. Make a cut from here to here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Full. Full. Okay. Look, I, I made actually because I, I did something already ahead of time, so I, I don't want to um, not do this while I spell. I I, I want to show you here an extraction socket because there's many times like questions about what to do with an extraction socket that you're doing a socket preservation. Now. So I have here a model which I have from Strawman, and um, you can see here. Um, this would be a potential implant placement or just a socket graft. And now I need to do the socket graft, right? So I did my socket graft already. So actually, my uh, associate here did it already. Placed the bone graft into place here. See? See a nice job here? And it's at the crest. And now I'm using a cytoplast membrane, right? Our traditional technique. To keep everything in place but now of course you want to do a suture so what is an efficient suture that you can do in a place like this so i want to show you that and and i usually use either a ptfe or a nylon for that so i want to use a nylon at this moment and let's take an um, 5 -0 resolon okay that's a 5 -0 resolon with a 13 millimeter needle Actually, we have and had a couple of questions come in while you've been going. Sorry about that. So one of the one of the questions people are asking is, what tissue forceps do you like to use? Oh, good question. Yeah. So here's my uh, favorite tissue uh, forceps right here. Look at this one. This is a, a Euphredi a TP5090. I, I say when I say to my team, I call it like, give me my plia with teeth. But look how small these teeth are, right? Very, very, very atraumatic. Um, the handle is not, I would say, the greatest. I would like it to be a little bit more economic. Um, it's still flat, but it works well. I've, I've used this for 25 years. It came from like um, cardiovascular surgery. Uh, and then I have other ones which are smaller for microsurgery. Um, but it's a really important uh, question to really use good, indeed, um, Tissue holders. Okay, so now we go to our closure here. Okay, Marina, if you can hold this again. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Focus. Okay. And I just want to show you here a nice and easy suturing technique. So what I do is I come from the buckle. So I'm taking my plier and I'm going full thickness. I don't go through the membrane. So I just go full thickness, right? From Again, it's quite a nice bite, maybe three millimeters. Then I go over the membrane. So the suture is now going over the membrane. I pull it. And look what I'm doing now. Now I'm going underneath the flap, so lingually. And it's going full thickness to the flap. Don't touch the membrane. And now when I pull it, It just goes right over the membrane. So this kind of pr compresses the membrane in an apical direction, right? You can see that. It's, it's laying right on the membrane. But now, of course, I want to go over the flap because I need to also get the margins to approximate each other. So what I do now with the next suture, I'll just lay it over. I'll go over this. And I will come again from the external flap internal so i go from the outer part to the inner part and come through here taking the flap how are we doing with time blake well I, I think we're a little bit we're a little tight on time there's also some other questions that have come in but i think the questions are really good so we should try to go a little bit over if you're okay with it okay um, you can just ask me the question if you want. I just want to show the suture. So this is this really the cool part of this yeah. suture. Look, it's an external suture now. And now I'll go let this suture run again over the membrane. And I go inside the lingual flap. And look what it will do. So right now it's going to cross. So I have two sutures which are running over the membrane. 
and pressing the membrane down. And now when I move this over and I close this suture on the buckle here with one. So it's one running suture, it will move the margins together. So I'm going to tie this off. Can everybody see this? So you see how I, in one yeah. very efficient suture technique, so this is my socket preservation suture technique. And the knot, again, is on the buckle. And I like to use a non resorbable suture for this, just like it's stable. Um, second knot. Third knot. The question has come in, do you ever place a hemostatic agent uh, on the palate when you're doing a CT graft, something like cert, uh, gel foam? Uh, you can, but it's in the technique that we use, it's not really necessary. So you okay. can. Okay, so look at this suture. Hmm? So another, another question okay. has come in specific to the Castro, Castro Viejo that you use. Uh, yeah. The, the question is about uh, using the 3 O suture. So they, they say that most of the Hugh Freedy Castro Viejo drivers are really rated for 4 O or smaller. Is there one that you specifically recommend? Yeah, so if you, I mean, I have, again, if you go into my Euphridi kit list, you'll see like, you know, there's a medium size Castorejo, which you can use also with 3O. There's also another one, a Castorejo from, um, which is thicker. So it can go with like a 2O or 3O. So you can buy actually different ones. But the one, the, the one that I have in my kit is like a medium size and I use it for 3O all the time. There's a, okay. a, a heavier one, but it's kind of a little bit heavier on the hands. Mine is really kind of, you know, still like really, when you're clicking it, uh, quite light. So it's easy to click. And some of the heavier ones can be a little bit too heavy. Okay, go ahead with more questions. There, it, it, it ends in the, the S-I-M, right? It says SIM at the end of it. Is that the one that you're describing? Yes, yes. Okay. Whatever is the one in my kit, yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, now another question has come in. So how do you minimize the chances of a, a coronally repositioned flap losing its coronal repositioning as it heals? Okay, can you repeat that? How do you minimize the chances of a coronally repositioned flap losing its coronal repositioning as it heals? So, I, I, oh, I, yeah. you know, you, you go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just, I don't really, I, I guess I have to like think about that question. But I guess what I'm thinking is like maybe just like that it will maybe not give you enough coronal repositioning. I mean, yeah, I, I don't really, I can't answer that. Okay. Um, okay, so let me show you one. Where's the PTFE suture here? So you asked for the horizontal mattress, and please continue with other questions. Dear, can you comment on suturing a, restore, a resorbable membrane to the periosteum when doing GBR? Uh, the, basically the lasso technique or the rib rose technique, one of those types of, uh, of procedures. Basically, we're using the, the suture itself as the way to fixate the membrane. Yes, and, and, and I like that technique. Uh, in in uh, my protocols, I use like GBR protocol one, which is like basically an implant placement with a simultaneous GBR. And in those cases, of course, like sometimes you want to stabilize it. And I use the lasso technique for that. Now, what you can do for the lasso technique, or we call it the sling suture, um, is that you can use it with a PTFE because it's so inert and so atraumatic, or you could use it with a glycolon. But to be quite honest, because I'm very, very always concerned about inflammation when I'm dealing with regeneration, I like to um, use a PTFE, and then I just remove it after about three weeks. So that gives me more control. But if I would use a resorbable suture, if that's your preference, I would use a glycolon. Okay, I'm just doing here the horizontal mattress. And you can see how I'm finishing it here. I made a small incision here on this uh, particular model. And um, basically now I went through the buckle margin and then I went to the lingual margin. And now you can see here the... suture. Let me show you here the palto suture and the buckle suture, okay? And now when we tie this, obviously it will move 
the margins in a coronal direction. So you can see that. I'm going to move that and look. See that? It's like sending you a friendly kiss. <laughs> right? See that? So, and you don't need to put too much tightness on that, so it doesn't need to be done. You just want to make sure that these, in, these uh, flap margins are going up. So basically, when you're about three millimeters apical to the incision margin, you basically get like the margin to go up three millimeters, so it's pretty cool. And, you know, depending on the size of the flap, you'll do multiple. And I suture this here, again, with four knots. Okay. So, am I alive, Steve? Okay. So I demonstrated One of the questions that's coming through. So on, the, on the horizontal mattress, uh, somebody is saying that on the horizontal mattress, sometimes they see that the suture pulls through on the lingual aspect at times. Do you have any tips or tricks to avoid that? I, I would say that my main my my main uh, comment would be. It's probably that you need to take a little bit longer or deeper bite so and make sure that you're going through full thickness because the horizontal mattress is a technique that obviously uh, will call um, for like good full thickness flap. So like, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy to uh, go through thin tissue because if you go, for example, through a lingual flap that is really thin, um, then it will pull through and you can get a necrosis. Perfect. Well, it's been a great presentation, Sasha. I really want to thank you for your time. I think uh, our, our audience has had a, a really good opportunity to learn from you and understand sutures and techniques, all the different materials, the knots, uh, the needles themselves. So I just want to thank you again for taking the time out of your busy schedule to help us educate everyone. Uh, as always, it's been a, a real pleasure to hear you speak and, and talk on this important topic. You're welcome, Blake. Yeah. So the only thing I can say is thank you to you guys, because like obviously uh, osteogenics is always doing a great job in um, sharing important clinical topics. You're not just interested in selling products, which is great uh, to support the community. And uh, I also want to, you know, obviously invite everybody who is uh, watching here, uh, do go into the guide uh, video library, because there's like over, you know, 500 clinical videos. So just, you know, go into that because you can learn so much from this. And I don't know what's happening with this video, but if it's good, we can even like uh, see if that can be uploaded to the video library. So please go to Guide Dental and see what, you know, training and education is good for you. So thanks uh, for having me, uh, Blake, and see you soon. Yeah, perfect. Uh, thank you everyone for watching. We hope you enjoyed the webinar. We will send out a feedback survey here shortly. Uh, and we just want to thank you one more time for spending part of your busy day and busy evenings with us here uh, on this webinar with Dr. Ivanovich. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Goodbye.